Okay, well, we'll start up again with our next uh, topic, which is going to be lipids and their various biological roles. We'll continue that on, uh, on Wednesday and then go on to nucleotides and nucleic acids. Now, the thing with lipids is they're predominantly hydrophobic. Some lipids have polar regions on them. And that's very important in some of their biological roles. But for the most part, lipids are very hydrophobic molecules. And that's why you would find them in things like cell membranes and the like. Lipids, when they're metabolized, also generate a great deal of metab uh, metabolic energy. That's why fats have so many calories in them. Those are types of lipids. So lipids are widely used in energy storage, for energy storage as well. Now, in addition, many lipids are used as biological signaling agents, hormones and things like that. There's many different kinds of lipids that play those types of roles. Now, there's a wide range of different lipids in terms of structurally and stuff. There's quite a few different types of lipids. We're going to focus on a few of the major kinds, but there are other kinds of lipids that are found in various parts of the cells and some of them in membranes and stuff that have other roles too. But we're going to look at focus at the major categories of lipids. First category of lipids are the ones that are based on glycerol and fatty acids. Now these are often used for energy storage and certain versions of them are most are used as the major components of cell membranes. Now the question is, what is glycerol and what is a fatty acid? Now glycerol, otherwise known as glycerin, when you go down to a supermarket or a drugstore to purchase the stuff, glycerol is a three carbon alcohol type molecule. You have three carbons and the OH groups coming from each one of them. So we have You said we don't need to know structures? Exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm just pointing this to show things. Okay. That's glycerol. Now, with all those OH groups on it, obviously glycerols, glycerol is going to be extremely soluble. In fact, you can make water glycerol solutions in any concentration you want. Glycerol is kind of a sweet tasting syrupy fluid at uh, room temperature. It's also a laxative, so it's not a good sweetener. <laughs> Fairly powerful laxative. Uh, but, at any rate, that's the structure of glycerol. Okay, now a fatty acid is basically a hydrocarbon chain with what we call an organic acid group at one end of it. So you have a chain. Now, in typical fatty acids are found in lipids are anywhere from about 12 or 14 to as many as 24, 26 carbons long. I don't want to draw that many carbons. So, I'm making a little short fatty acid. Okay, this is a fatty acid, and of course, this is what we call an organic acid. Okay? So obviously, now that organic acids are extremely polar, they tend to lose a proton in solution. That's why we call them an acid. Okay? They're extremely polar, but the rest of the molecule is a hydrocarbon. It's extremely hydrophobic. So overall, this molecule is very hydrophobic. You just have that one rather polar end. Now, we can join a fatty acid to glycerol by a condensation reaction. So let's take this fatty acid and stick the glycerol above it. Okay, that's glycerol. Now what we can do here is we can take this hydrogen, whoops, oh, I'm actually going to, sorry, move it here. Okay. We can take this hydrogen and this OH group here from the fatty acid and from the glycerol. 
remove it in the form of water, and now make ourselves a covalent bond from the oxygen to the carbon. We have now joined the fatty acid to the glycerol. In fact, this type of molecule would be called a monoglyceride. We see monoglycerides as food additives. What they tend to do, you sometimes see in food labels, has mono and diglycerides. Diglycerides, of course, have two fatty acids attached to glycerol. Those molecules are used as emulsifiers. What it is, is they can kind of mix with hydrophobic oily things, like oil, and mix to a certain extent with polar stuff like water. So that way it keeps your salad dressing from separating out and things like that. So a lot of times you see in food products it contains mono and diglycerides. Okay, that's what these things are. Alright, and of course a triglyceride would have three fatty acids. We'll see those in a little bit. Okay, that's an overall structure. Once again, you're not responsible for detailed structure. I just want to show you how these guys are put together. Alright, now Fatty acids. There are two broad categories of fatty acids, and that plays a great deal of importance in properties of the lipids that contain these fatty acids. What we're going to do over on this side is make a fatty acid here. Once again, I'm going to make a fairly short one. fatty acid is every single carbon. Carbons have single bonds to other carbons and then those two remaining chemical bonds are going to be used to attach to hydrogens. In fact, you could not put any more hydrogens on this molecule if you wanted to. So we could sometimes say that this fatty acid is saturated with hydrogens. We call this a saturated fatty acid. Now, what saturated fatty acids are, are they have no double bonds between carbons. And they have only single carbon to carbon bonds. Okay, so that's a saturated fatty acid. But there is also the opposite type of fatty acid, the other major class of fatty acids. So we'll put our organic acid group over here. And in this case, we have a single double bond between one of the, between two of the carbons. And these fatty acids that have double bonds, one or more double bonds between the carbons, are called unsaturated fatty acids. And you could have monounsaturated fatty acids with a single double bond, or you could have a fatty acid with more than one double bond, a polyunsaturated fatty acid. Now that actually leads to some characteristics of these molecules and lipids that are composed mostly of saturated or mostly of unsaturated fatty acids. Now, the reason we have this bend over here is not that I screwed up on the drawing. The reason we have this bend here is that 
When you have that double bond, the molecule bends at about a 30 degree angle. On the other hand, and that's typical, every time you have a double carbon to carbon bond on a fatty acid, you induce a bend in that. Now, on the other hand, our saturated fatty acid is ramrod straight. <laughs> and lipids, and that has a big difference in how lipids containing them deal with that. Think of this. If I were to take a whole bunch of um, saturated fatty acids, I could jam a whole bunch of them into a small place because they're nice and ramrod straight. So you put them all together and you can pack a lot of them in a close area. And they will gently stick to each other because they're all hydrophobic. And of course, if there's water around, they're going to snuggle up together and try to avoid the water. Now, on the other hand, let's take a whole bunch of unsaturated fatty acids. They have beds in the molecule. You cannot pack them as tightly together as you could saturated fatty acids. They would be packed relatively loosely together, like so. And likewise, lipids containing them would be the same thing. Now, that actually has a significant difference on the properties of lipids that contain saturated or unsaturated fatty acids. And to see an idea of that, let's go take a little mental trip down to the local Winn-Dixie. All right. Now, let's suppose we go and get something that is high, that has lipids high in unsaturated fatty acids. Say, corn oil works pretty good. Now, you take corn oil. Corn oil is a liquid at room temperature. Now, if I took corn oil and put it in the refrigerator, it will still stay liquid. If I put it in the freezer, it will start to freeze, at least if the freezer is cold enough. But it basically stays liquid at room temperature and has a fairly low melting point. In other words, to solidify, you have to get it quite cold, freezer temperatures. And corn oil is full of unsaturated fatty acids. Now let's take something that has a lot of monosaturated fatty acids. In other words, they have a single double, double, double carbon to carbon bond. Now, I take that. Olive oil is a good example. I take olive oil. It's a liquid room temperature, but if I put olive oil in the refrigerator, trust me, I've done this, it will actually solidify up. Corn oil you have to put in the freezer to solidify. Now, on the other hand, let's go the opposite direction, something that is loaded up with saturated fatty acids. Since this is the deep south, let's take the old southern favorite, lard. Right? You can still buy that in stores. Okay. So we get a nice big tub of lard and coat everything with it and bread it and deep fry it in that. Okay. People still do that. They deep fry turkeys here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, what's lard like at room temperature? It's solid. You don't have to put it in the refrigerator, much less the freezer. It's solid at room temperature. As a matter of fact, lard and things high in saturated fatty acids have melting points that are scalding hot. You have to put it in a frying pan or a deep fryer to liquefy the stuff. And that's true of other things that are high in saturated fatty acids. Beef tail, beef fat, that uh, coconut oil, that's actually a solid at room temperature, it's full of saturated fatty acids. Butter, all those kinds of things that are solid at room temperature have high amounts of saturated fatty acids in them. Stuff that's liquid at room temperature have a lot of unsaturated fatty acids in them. Okay, so we have that, that kind of situation. And if you get these margarines and stuff, what they do, you look at the ingredient label, it says, you know, made partially hydrogenated corn oil. What they do is to keep it solid at room temperature, they take these unsaturated fatty acids in corn oil, put in a pressure vessel filled with hydrogen gas, and occasionally a hydrogen atom, hydrogen will come in and basically grab onto carbon and break that double bond. So, when you have things that are made of corn oil but solid room temperature, what they've done 
is they turn some of the saturated fatty, uh, the unsaturated fatty acids back into saturated fatty acids. Okay, now we see this kind of situation at the supermarket. Why is this important in biology? Second like cardiovascular disease. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, in biology, it's this. Cell membranes are made mostly of glycerol and fatty acid-based lipids. Now, the lipids in cell membranes have to be effectively in a fluid or liquid state. Actually, more kind of like a slushy state would be more accurate. But they have to be kind of liquid. Because inside cell membranes, you have proteins and all kinds of other molecules. And these molecules have to move around inside the membrane. One protein may have to, one membrane protein may have to bind to and interact with another membrane protein. If they're floating around the membrane, and the membrane's in a fluid or liquid state, they can drift around just like boats drifting around the water. On the other hand, if the membrane solidifies, it's just like having boats out in a body of water that's frozen on you. Can't move around very much. You know, have a lot of ports that are important up in the north and stuff, and you know, get a lot of shipping in these ports in the summer. But in the winter, when those ports ice over, the shipping grinds to a halt. You can't move ships around very well in, in layers of ice unless you're an icebreaker. Okay, so same kind of thing. If cell membranes effectively turn into a solid state, like lard at room temperature, Membrane function shuts down and the cell is going to die. So cell membranes have to have a proportion of saturated and unsaturated fatty acids that keep them just at the proper level of liquidity at whatever temperature those membranes are exposed in. If the membranes freeze up, that's it. The cell's dead. So we have to make sure that the membranes have the right saturate to unsaturate fatty acid ratio in order to function properly. And that's basically what we see here. If you take like two species of fish, fish are ectothermic or quote cold-blooded organisms. If you take two species of fish that are close relative to each other, if you get a cold water species, you'll find that it's fats and its membrane lipids are very high in unsaturated fatty acids. All of those are kind that people, uh, that they recommend people eat lots of, and that includes stuff like cod and uh, salmon and stuff like that. They have trout, they like fairly cold waters. On the other hand, even close to related species that live in warm waters and tropical waters like, you know, uh, uh, Caribbean coral reefs and stuff like that, they're going to have more saturated fatty acids in their membrane lipids and in their storage fats and stuff than the cold water species will because they want to keep their, it's warmer, they can have more saturated fatty acids and keep their membrane still appropriately liquid at that type of temperature. There are even organisms that alter the membrane composition as the seasons change. So, in effect, it's like it's summary of one lipid composition. As winter approaches, you start replacing saturated with unsaturated fatty acids so that your lipids are still properly fluid in the temperatures and conditions you're about to face. So some organisms change the lipid composition on a seasonal basis to make sure that their membrane lipids, their membranes are properly in the proper fluid state. Okay, so that's saturated and unsaturated fatty acids and lipids containing them. And like I say, it's not just important in the supermarket, it's also quite important in biology as well. All right.